Dr. Tracy Dennis has a strong record of teaching and leadership experience in pre-K through 12th underfunded schools. As a scholar of anti-black racism and anti-racist teaching, her teaching and scholarship supports the development of teacher candidates' anti-racist knowledge and helps them translate anti-racist theories into practice in pre-K through 12th schools, classrooms, and curriculum. Dr. Dennis presents her work at local, national, and international conferences and has articles published in the Journal of Negro Education and the Journal of Education and Social Justice. Please welcome Dr. Dennis. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Dennis, and today I will be discussing what is critical race theory and why do people want to stop it. As I outline my talking points for today, I want to note that I tell my students all the time that my goal is to build critical thinkers and problem solvers. So during today's talk, my goal is not to indoctrinate you, not to try to convince you to believe what I believe, my goal today is to share my understandings of critical race theory so that you can formulate your own questions, beliefs, and assumptions about this framework. So today we're going to be talking about defining CRT, the miseducation of CRT, unpacking language, which I feel is very important and critical, discussing what critical race theory is not, and then discussing what critical race theory is, debunking some common themes, and misconceptions, and then I'd like to share three counter-narratives that will illuminate critical race theory in practice. So I want to start by reading a quote by Bell Hooks. She states, there must exist a paradigm, a practical model for social change that includes an understanding of ways to transform consciousness that are linked to efforts to transform structures. I wanted to start with this quote because I believe that it is a great framing for the next 40 minutes or so of discussion. Structural barriers exist that create race-based disparities in education, employment, healthcare, economics, housing, justice, and communities, to name a few. I believe that critical race theory is that paradigm, that practical model that Hook speaks of for social change that can help us understand and make sense of inequitable outcomes and opportunities and can help transform our consciousness, which is necessary to transform systemic and structural barriers. So what is critical race theory? I'm going to define what it means. Critical race theory, as you've heard earlier, from other speakers is the heir to critical legal studies, which wasn't expansive enough to address the challenges and injustices people of color faced in this country. So to sh in short, it didn't address the complexities of race and racism. Critical race theory challenges and confronts the dominant narrative and reveals how race was constructed for economic and political gain. It, it pushes us as teachers, scholars, leaders, and students to look critically at any text, event, issue, or disparity, and try to understand the different perspectives that are sometimes silenced, sidelined, marginalized, discounted, or rendered invisible. So as it was stated earlier by our county executive, the, uh, critical race theory operates on three basic premises. Racism is pervasive, Racism is permanent, and racism must be challenged. So how did critical race theory go from being a way of understanding how American racism has shaped public policy outcomes, opportunities, and the lived experiences of racialized peoples in this country to a harmful discourse that paints all whites with a broad brush as racist, makes white children feel bad about themselves, and divides our nation? In order to reframe the narrative, we have to understand what critical race theory is and is not. I'm going to start by unpacking each word in isolation so that we can get at the root of the problem with this framework and understand why this topic is so charged and facing such vitriolic attacks. So when we look up critical, critical is exercising or involving careful judgment or judicious evaluation. Parents and society want their students to be critical thinkers and problem solvers, right? 
That's what high quality education is about. Not rote memorization, not drill, but critical thinking. No problem there, right? Pretty innocuous definition that does not cause anyone to get emotionally charged or upset. So now let's unpack theory. A theory is a supposition or a system of ideas intended to explain something, especially one based on general principles independent of the thing to be explained. A theory is just that, not an indictment, not a fact, but a supposition or a hypothesis. So this definition, like critical, does not bring about any intense emotional charge. Now, let's look at the third word in the framework. Ah, race. There it is. When we get to race, race is, socially is a socially constructed categories based on a set of phenotypic features, pseudoscience, and laws that have fluid boundaries over time and space. So when we get to race, this is where the problem lies. People may not have a problem with critical or with theory, but race is what gets our blood boiling, makes us angry and upset. Why? Because we don't want to talk about it. Shh, be quiet. Discussing racism is racist. As Dr. Ladson Billing says, our issue with critical race theory is our inability to confront race and racism as a system that works against us all. So let's unpack some of the misconceptions and fallacies of critical race theory that are pervasive. I wanna first start by talking about what critical race theory is not. So critical race theory is not a curriculum. It does not divide people into oppressed and oppressive groups. Looks, it looks at policies and practices, not people. So individuals are not interrogated, systems, histories, and structures are interrogated. It's not a framework that espouses all white people are racist, and it does not damage and demoralize white students. It does not discriminate against people based on their whiteness, and it doesn't cause people to hate our country or become anti-American. It also does not pit people of color against white people. These now famous fallacies are spreading like wildfire and causing parents and politicians to attempt to ban and silence all conversations about race, racism, and its historical roots. So what is critical race theory? Critical race theory is a framework that focuses on confronting and challenging systemic racism. It's changing beliefs and mindsets. It focuses on validating and affirming all voices and lived experiences. It allows minoritized people to name their reality. And it provides counter stories and counter narratives to dominant constructions of outcomes. It also allows marginalized people to articulate their lived experiences and have their voices be heard. It grants another perspective and aims to disrupt deficit thinking and helps people identify and critique the causes of social inequality in their own lives. So CRT seeks to explain disparities that exist due to systemic and structural racism in the United States, not to divide, not to say one group is better than another. So some common themes, and I know we've all heard a lot of these, common themes that undermine critical race theory are, I don't see color, talking about race is racist. Racism doesn't matter. It's safer to stay color mute. Deny racial re denying racial realities. Success is based on personal merit or meritocracy. Do not, does not examine outcomes or events through a race-based lens and failure to interrogate ourselves and determine how the beliefs and, in, and assumptions that we have heard and, and been introduced to have impacted how we, how we interact with, relate to, react to people of color. So we need to focus on what we were told and how, what we've experienced at home and in school and in our communities and, how, and in our social circles and how that impacts our beliefs and assumptions. So CRT asserts that the tenets are racism is pervasive and normal, color blindness, meritocracy, and neutrality are fallacies, racially marginalized voices and experiences should be centered, 
And racism and white supremacy should be explicitly named and interrogated. And along those same lines, CRT scholars challenge neutrality, objectivity, colorblindness, and meritocracy. So I would like to address three common misconceptions about CRT. The first misconception one is critical race theory in inflicts emotional distress on white students. Recent hate incidents at schools in Minnesota and Kansas, Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, illuminate prevalent harm and violence that students of color are experiencing in schools. When we ban conversations about race, racism, and white supremacy and its historical roots, we are harming all children and enabling emotional distress to be inflicted on a lack of knowledge and understanding of historical hate, separatism, and violence. Across the US, there are two conversations about race going on at the same time. In some, in one case, white parents are telling school leaders that lessons about race make white students feel bad. And then on the other hand, there's the actual racism that's happening in schools. One of the parents at the Minnesota school where the children experienced race-based violence said her son endured so much abuse that he told her he didn't want to be black anymore. When one group or person dehumanizes another group or person, that person or group loses their own humanity in the process. Losing your humanity causes emotional distress, and that should be our concern. Not being able to build understanding and compassion for the people that we interact with every day, our peers, our neighbors, our colleagues, our classmates, our communities, that dehumanizes us. By eliminating or silencing discussions of race and racism in this country and in our schools, we are robbing students of the opportunity to humanize each other based on, complete, on a complete and accurate understanding of each other's history. Limiting or censoring the history that students are exposed to renders them unable to critically analyze and discuss topics of race and racism. Just like we want our students to understand linear equations, metaphors, similes, figurative language, they must have a complete and balanced understanding of the historical roots on which this country was founded. I'm gonna show you the pyramid of hate. And the pyramid of hate shows biased behaviors growing in complexity from the bottom to the top. Looking at the first level of the pyramid of hate, we see that biased attitudes, including accepting negative or misinformation, screening out positive information, can lead us up higher levels of the pyramid. Or said more bluntly, Failure to challenge racism at the lower levels will almost guarantee that we move to the higher levels of violence that you see reflected in the recent news stories from the other slide. When our history's truth is hidden and misinformation is provided in its place, students are more likely to engage in bias-motivated violence. Additionally, when students are told to shh and discouraged from discussing race and racism in their schools and communities, they begin to believe that having conversations about race and racism is taboo and never feel empowered to challenge, critique, or question the status quo. Students will be living and working in a racially diverse society and not acknowledging, analyzing, and critiquing our racial history stifles students' critical thinking and their ability to challenge race-based inequalities in their communities and in their personal and professional lives. Misconception number two, CRT promotes radical ideologies meant to divide us. CRT is not a radical ideology that divides us, but I am going to provide a brief description and explanation of two pervasive ideologies that do divide us. They are meritocracy and colorblindness. The pull yourself up by your bootstraps analogy only works if you were given boots in the first place. The meritocracy myth posits that we all enter the world with the same resources, opportunities, and support to self-actualize and thrive. Advancing the idea that the playing field is level and we are all afforded the same opportunities and resources for success is a radical ideology that divides us. When policies like affirmative action are introduced, 
they are often met with backlash because people do not understand that we are not given the same advantages and opportunities to self-actualize and thrive in the first place. Colorblindness is another radical ideology that divides us. Saying I don't see race or race doesn't matter, when you say I don't see color, what you're really saying is that you do not see people as individuals with unique identities, languages, ethnicities, cultures, backgrounds, lived experiences, families, and communities. The truth is that we all see color, and it's disingenuous and divisive to claim otherwise. As you can see from slide 15, with recent news incidents of race-based hatred and violence in schools, students do see color and are demonstrating hatred and causing harm and violence based on skin color. This was not brought about by critical race theory. Additionally, the history is the history. We cannot go back and erase the past. Our country has a violent and racist past, and to pretend that it did not exist will not unite us. In fact, it will serve to further divide us. And finally, the country was founded on unequal treatment, unfair treatment, and unjust treatment, this country. To pretend that we had a rosy past is insulting and inaccurate to our students and to people of color. We cannot sweep the atrocities of the past under the rug and pretend that they didn't exist. Only through acknowledging and confronting our ugly past can we move forward. Race and racism are interconnected with housing, employment, healthcare, education, and the economy. Failure to analyze and critique outcomes through a racialized lens will almost guarantee that structural and systemic racist policies and practices remain intact and do not change. And finally, misconception three. Critical race theory paints all whites as racist. White people as individuals are not interrogated through critical race theory frameworks. Systems and structures are. Racism is maintained by systems and structures, not individual people. Not mere, it's not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice. CRT does not advance that all white people are racist but it does advance that white, white supremacy is an ideology, a pattern of values and beliefs ingrained in the United States. CRT builds our critical consciousness, which is our ability to critically examine events and outcomes from a racialized lens. It requires asking critical questions and engaging in critical self-reflection. In the second part of this talk, I we will ask critical questions and engage in critical self-reflection. So why is CRT important? When you hold on to the ideologies and beliefs of white supremacy, you are more likely to reproduce them. Notice I said hold on, not hold. This is because none of us were born believing one race is superior and another race is inferior. We were taught these ideologies and beliefs. Actually, we all were, including people of color, which is why stereotype threat and imposter syndrome exist. So because we learn them, we can unlearn them. Or put more simply, if we hold them, we can release them. Inequitable systems continue to operate because we tacitly or overtly support them in explicit and implicit ways. As, as we all know by now, race is a social construct. We were taught that races are different. We were taught that some people are intellectually and behaviorally inferior. CRT helps us unlearn what we've been taught. As we note the Spanish philosopher George Santana's words, think about this. When you visit a doctor's office, the first thing they ask you is about is, about is your medical history. Did anyone in your family have breast cancer, heart problems, diabetes, high blood pressure? We tell our doctors the truth about our medical history because we know it will save our lives. Teaching young people about atrocities from the past instead of hiding and suppressing them may make them less likely to reproduce hatred and violence once they understand historical underpinnings. As I said earlier, no one is born inferior or less intelligent. We are taught that. And when you think about the pyramid of hate, you are less likely to go up it when you have 
accurate information about our history. Not telling the doctor truthful information about your medical history can cause hurt and harm in the same way that not providing our students with truthful information about our country's history can cause the reproduction and perpetuation of deficit beliefs, ideologies, and actions that harm marginalized people. Revisiting the idea of asking critical questions and engaging in critical self-reflection, I am now going to provide three counter narratives that illuminate the importance of critical race theory and the value in conducting an analysis of outcomes from a racialized lens. So what is a counter narrative? Counter narratives refer to the narratives that arise from the vantage point of those who have been historically marginalized. A counter narrative goes beyond the notion that those in relative positions of power can just tell stories of those in the margins. Instead, they must come from the margins. A counter narrative is told from the perspectives and voices of those individuals. The effect of a counter narrative is to empower and give agency to those communities. By choosing their own words and telling their own stories, members of marginalized communities provide alternative points of view, help to create complex narratives that, and help to create complex narratives that truly present their realities. So why are counter narratives important? Counter narratives counter hegemonic constructions of the lived realities of people of color. So dominant narratives of groups racialized as non-white are perpetuated via colorblind explanations about social problems. The achievement gap exists because students of color are intellectually inferior, oh, they're unmotivated, or they and their parents and communities just don't care about their future. Everything that's happening now is rooted in historical racism and oppression. So first I'm gonna tell a, a community counter narrative from Dr. Bettina Love. She has a fantastic book called We Want to Do More Than Survive, Abolitionist Teaching and the Pursuit of Educational Freedom. In her chapter on community, Dr. Love describes Rochester, which is her hometown. It was the first land of the Iroquois Nation, one of the final stops on the Underground Railroad. She talks about Harriet Tubman visiting, Frederick Douglass visiting. It was filled with revered and feared activists and abolitionists, and it had a rich history of activism and community building. Her 19th Ward community was a close-knit community. She attended city recreation centers, which were everywhere. She was part of the Boys and Girls Club, Flint Street City Recreation Center, and the Southwest Area Neighborhood Association, also known as SWAN. Everyone in the community knew her and her family and looked out for her well-being and safety. Jobs were abundant in her Rochester community. She notes Wegmans, Paychex, Xerox, Bausch & Loam, Eastman Kodak, her mom worked at Kodak, her dad was a sky cap at the airport, and Kodak accounted for about 60% of Rochester's workforce 30 years prior. However, in 2012, Kodak declared bankruptcy, went from 62,000 to less than 70,000 employees, and accounted for just 6% of the, the workforce. Decent paying jobs, once abundant, quickly dried up in her community. She then mentions the gutting of dark communities, where employment opportunities became sparse, drugs were introduced to the community. She talked about the Rockefeller drug laws, where Rockefeller came up with a mandatory, mandatory prison sentences of 15 years to life for drug dealers and addicts, even those caught with small amounts of marijuana, cocaine, or heroin. And these drug laws, Rockefeller drug laws, disproportionately affected black men. She then describes that her once thriving community full of manufacturing giants fell. So it was the fall of manufacturing giants, increase in language that justifies a carceral, carceral state, war on drugs, and a socio-political power structure that keeps whites at the top. So Dr. Love says, understanding the gutting of dark communities is important to interrogate, especially when analyzing a community. In 2013, Rochester had the lowest graduation rates in the state. 
is currently one of the poorest cities in America. And in 2017, Rochester School District had the lowest academic growth amongst the 11,000 school districts. So a formerly thriving community filled with early abolitionist teachers, community organizers, and civil rights leaders was destroyed. So when you're examining outcomes, it's important to analyze events and outcomes through a CRT lens. Without knowing the rich history of this once thriving community, Rochester community, it's easy to go deficit and blame the inhabitants of the community instead of looking at systems and structures, policies, practices, and laws that played a role in the destruction of this once thriving community. So you could say students, parents in their communities in Rochester are lazy, unmotivated, unintelligent, do not care about their own children's future, or you could look at Jim Crow, school desegregation, urban development and gentrification, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, redlining, police brutality, school rezoning and closings, and globalization of the, U of the US manufacturing industry. So now, and banishing public sector jobs and lack of high quality educational opportunities. So now it's time for our critical questions. How do you make sense of blighted communities? Do you blame the inhabitants? Oh, only if they worked harder. Only if they got a better education, they could be living like me because I worked hard and I, got a, and I have a good education. So that's what we need to think about. Next, I'm going to provide a housing counter narrative from renowned scholar Gloria Ladson Billings, founder of Culturally Responsive Pedagogy. Dr. Ladson Billings tells the story of her father, a World War II veteran who served his country. When he came home to Philadelphia, he decided to purchase a home for his family. He decided to buy a home in the Levittown section with the $8,000 he got for his GI Bill. However, the, due to Clause 25, which stipulated that no person other than a Caucasian could purchase, lease, or buy a Levittown home, her, her father bought a house in West Philadelphia. A white GI, using the same $8,000, purchased a home in the all-white Levittown. The white GI's home in Levittown appreciated to $565,000, while her father's West Philadelphia home appreciated to $93,000. As you can clearly see the loss of wealth that occurred over time, her father could not have access to the home in Levittown to accrue generational wealth for his family due to a system that prevented him from buying a house in the all-white community, even though he qualified financially and as a veteran. A system prevented her father from gaining substantial wealth through home ownership. So again, it is important to analyze these events and outcomes through a CRT lens. What are your beliefs and assumptions? For example, if you are not aware that racially restricted covenants like Clause 25 existed, you may assume that her father did not work as hard or was not as smart as people living in Levittown instead of understanding that the housing agreement forbade homes in Levittown from being used or occupied by any person other than members of the Caucasian race. So let's take a look now at the rate of home ownership in US by race. Time for the next critical question. Do you ever stop to think why black home ownership is at disproportionately lower rates? What structures, policies, and practices can account for these disparate home ownership rates? And our final counter narrative is around education is extremely painful but important to reveal as many Americans do not know the history behind the Native American boarding schools. This education counter narrative outlines atrocities committed against Native American children and the impact of those atrocities on their educational outcomes. Indigenous people had developed their own school system. They developed their own children as capable, competent individuals who knew their own history as a people and were skilled artisans. Children had a strong awareness of how to function and live in relationship to one's own environment. And the indigenous community had their own ways of educating their own to be capable, competent adults. Then in 1568, the first schools were established. Boarding schools attempted to assimilate and educate Native Americans into new white ways. 
Indigenous people said the boarding schools were designed to anglicize them and take away their sense of identity and who they are. Carlisle Indian School was created in 1879. Not only were Native American children torn away from their parents and communities, there was also a systematic tearing away of, the, of their culture and traditions. Also in the 1800s, parents could not travel thousands of miles to see their children. So at the boarding schools, the children suffered physical and emotional abuse, verbal violence, shaming for who they are, which impacted the self-image of the child. Additionally, the boarding school's goal was to completely reshape the Indian child, culturally, spiritually, environmentally, and remake the Native American in the image of the white man white in speech, white in work skills, and white in attitudes. The narrative was removing the child to save them. Imagine someone taking your children and you are never to see them again. They had rations, cattle and flour were withheld unless children were given over to the boarding schools. Parents fought back. So imagine having to give up your kids or starve. They cut the children's hair, as long hair was a symbol of savagery and wildness. In the Native American culture, hair is only cut when there's a death. So the children were confused. Two thirds of the children attended these boarding schools, 20% graduated high school and 80% did not and returned home. Sociological impacts were great. In boarding schools with no parents around, other than a house parent who was responsible for more than 30 children, uh, children when they came back home did not know how to parent. There was a lot of abuse, neglect, and alcoholism that can be traced back to the children's treatment in the boarding schools. One boarding school student remembers she could not speak Cheyenne, her native tongue, or would be punished for it. And then Dr. Fleming states, can you understand that we are a product of that history? Who we are today is because of our parents, our grandparents, and great grandparents experience that. We need you to understand where we are coming from. Dr. Fleming says, we don't know our heritage. Our families couldn't hand it down. Children were wiped of their native tongue and ways. Once again, it's important to analyze events and outcomes through a CRT lens. Many Americans have no idea of boarding schools and the deleterious impact on Native American children and their families for years to come. So as you look at some statistics, Native Americans long have had one of the highest high school dropout rates of any ethnic group in the nation. The Condition of Education 2020 reports that Native American students perform two to three grade levels below their white peers in reading and math. And they were two times more likely to drop out of school than their white peers. One who does not know about the harmful and violent history of Native American boarding schools may assume Native American students are intellectually inferior, not motivated, lack self-control. Instead of, they were historically robbed of family, parents, language, traditions, cultures, ways of being and knowing that impacted their ability to function in their communities. So back to our criti critical questions. When you look at public high school graduation rates by race and ethnicity, do you ever stop to think why Native American students are graduating high school at disproportionately lower rates? What are your beliefs and assumptions about the data? How do your beliefs and assumptions change knowing the history of Native American boarding schools? So as you can see, from the three stories, CRT is a way of explaining racial disparities. It's a way to analyze and make sense of these disparities and disparate outcomes as regular ongoing patterns in healthcare, employment, education, housing, and justice. Finally, I'm gonna close out by discussing the achievement gap through a CRT lens. The achievement gap, which really should be called an opportunity and access gap, is defined as a significant and persistent disparity in academic performance or educational attainment between different groups of students, such as white students and minoritized students, or students from higher income and lower socioeconomic backgrounds. 
Typically, the achievement gap is attributed to low intellectual capacity of black and brown students. However, analyzing this gap through a CRT lens disrupts deficit con constructions of the academic capabilities of black and brown students. Some alternative causes include lack of access to an enriched curriculum and high quality teachers and teaching, unequal funding, disparate discipline, disproportionate special education, advanced placement, and gifted and talented assignments. Also, school discipline disparities lead to a discipline gap. So when we look at school suspension data by race, it paints a very different picture than black and brown children are more prone to misbehave, um, be more disruptive and violent, it's more aligned to stereotypes and biases that contribute to who we label as disruptive and disrespectful, and that's based on racist constructions and beliefs about certain students. So speaking of the discipline gap, the discipline gap is um, based on research by Skiba, Lewis, Hancock, James, Lark, and Lark. Their disproportionate discipline policies and procedures meted out to certain student groups at rates that supersede, sometimes drastically, the group's statistical representation in particular school populations. So think about this. If, I'm if I spend more time suspended out of school, in out of school suspensions, I miss 10 days I'm suspended here, 10 more days I'm suspended here, 10 more days I'm suspended here. There are only 180 days in the school year for PK-12 students. So multiple suspensions means I'm out of the classroom, I'm missing out on learning, I'm missing out on instructional time, of course my achievement's going to suffer. And to close out, as an educator, I would be remiss if I did not discuss the current and ongoing debates about banning discussions of race and racism in classrooms across the country. In 1995, Gloria Ladson Billings coined the term culturally relevant pedagogy and defined it as having three criteria. Students must experience academic success, students must develop or maintain cultural competence, and students must develop a critical consciousness in which they challenge the status quo of the social order. It is the third tenet of CRP that I want to focus on. Tenet three calls on teachers to build students' sociopolitical consciousness so that they can challenge and critique the status quo. Gloria Ladson Billings' tenet three of culturally responsive pedagogy is key to building an anti-racist, more compassionate, and empathetic society of future citizens and leaders. Without having critical conversations about race and racism and its historical roots, accomplishing the goal of tenant three is impossible. Systemic and institutional racism exist. If students do not understand this history and build their racial literacy, they're not going to be able to identify and critique the causes of social inequality in their own lives and build sociopolitical consciousness necessary to challenge and critique the status quo. When you decapitate a child's ability for critical reflection, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the true tragedy. In closing, I would like to leave you with three key takeaways. And they are, critical race theory provides a race conscious framework with which to examine inequity, power, and justice within a given social structure. Historical constructions of race have shaped systemic racism today. And third, in order to eliminate unjust, unfair, and unequal treatment and bring about adaptive, sustainable change, we must apply a critical race theory framework to issues relating to our respective fields, healthcare, education, housing, employment, and justice. Thank you so much for listening and learning with me today. I hope that you continue the very important work of self-interrogation and of building your racial literacy and your social political consciousness. Have a great afternoon and have empowering conversations in your breakout room. Thank you so much. Thank Dr. You. Dennis, I just want to say, I mean, you not only uh, raised many, many things that even as a practitioner of this work, um, I heard you loudly and clearly and have 
taken those action steps uh, and put them in my own toolbox, mm -hmm. and I'll be sharing that with the college community. So thank you so much for that. Um, I can take uh, questions from the audience. I can take questions uh, on, on the chat. And uh, let's see, there is one question that's come in. What is your response to people when they ask, doesn't it try to make white kids hate themselves? I presume that means it meaning critical, the critical race, theory. race theory. Again, so it's really not an interrogation of people. Critical race theory interrogates systems and structures. And I think that's where the misconception or the fallacy lies. It's not attacking a person. A person doesn't have enough power to shut down an entire, to, to affect the kind of, uh, inequality that systems and structures do. And so I think in the interrogation of the systems and the structures, that's where the focus needs to be, not on people. Because people don't have, individual people don't have enough power to shut down a system. So I think when parents are saying it makes children feel bad about themselves, critical race theory, again, is not a curriculum, it's, a, it's not even, it's a framework. And so if the framework is presented in the way that it was intended to, which is to critically analyze outcomes in events, disparate outcomes in events, through a racialized lens, that's where the learning occurs. Got you. Thank you. Another question, why, why do people believe that CRT makes black kids feel inferior? Hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> I think, and again, of course, I'm not in every classroom in the United States, and I don't know, I think critical race theory, what, when people are saying critical race theory is being caught, taught in their classrooms, in their children's classrooms, it's not. I would be curious to see how teachers are, talk, are discussing race and racism. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if race and racism is being discussed through a historic lens, through a, a lens of systems and structures, not people, then those problems will not surface as readily. So I think the problem is not interrogating, interrogating the systems and the structures has to happen, not interrogating people. That's not what teachers should be doing. That's not what um, schools should be doing. It's really more of a higher level and looking at the history and the way this country was founded. Because teaching about our history, mm -hmm. just like we teach about I mean, we teach so many things. We teach literature, we teach math, we teach science, we teach social studies. Like, teaching the history of this country is just as important as knowing a liter what a linear equation is or how to solve for it or what a metaphor is. So that's what I think people need to move away from, this whole idea of it's indoctrination, it's teaching kids to feel bad about themselves. No, it's actually just like you want your kids to be able to solve a complex equation and write a metaphor or a simile, you want your kids to have a clear and accurate understanding of the history of this country. Right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Any questions from the audience? <laughs> thank you, County, <laughs> County Executive Elridge, thank you so much. Professor, I just wanted to say that I thought you did one of the fairest explanations about this that I've seen anybody. Oh, thank you. But how do you talk about how these things get reframed? Because that's really important, and I, do, and I agree with you that technique. That is not a good skill for a sense of inferiority. It just plays out what happens. Thank you so much. They have more important there. They can observe it, and they can understand it. And that is what we think that's a lot of Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, what you're talking about is uh, something that Maya Angelou said. History, despite its wretching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Mm. So in teaching and, what, and the things that we do day to day uh, in the curriculum and in the co-curricular, we need to be explicit about our history, about our full history. Mm -hmm. And through that sharing, and through acknowledgement, mm -hmm. 
it is our hope that we will not live it again. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and in many ways, where we are today, you know, has taken us back so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think in terms of just moving forward from, you know, from the um, rhetoric that we are hearing now, the, the, the hatred mm -hmm. that we are hearing now, and, and moving forward, what, what are our next steps? I think it's important for us to really understand the harm that we're causing all kids. And so I think about it from the lens of, and that's why I started with critical in theory. All parents want their kids to be critical thinkers. All kids, all parents want their kids to be problem solvers. And so if you really think about, if you want the best for your kid, looking at those stories mm -hmm. of the, the slave petition and the, the beating of the, of the black children, that's heartbreaking. No parent wants that for their kid. No parent wants their kid to dehumanize another kid. No parent wants their kid to not have a critical understanding of this country's history, I, I would hope, I would believe. And so that's what I think where the conversation needs to begin. Like everybody comes together commonly. What do you want for your kid, mm -hmm. black parent? What do you want for your kid, white parent? What do you want mm -hmm. for your kid, Asian parent? What do you want for your kid, Latinx parent? And then what you're gonna hear is a commonality. All parents want the same for their kids. Right. So then when you're shutting down conversations of race and racism, we're never gonna get to that goal of what you have for your kid. Right. To be a good person, a decent human being, to move forward a great citizen, mm -hmm. you're never gonna have that if some kids don't have an understanding of historical hatred and violence, and then some kids do. It's just, it, it's almost common sense that you would want your kids to be the best version of themselves they could be. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, from that new story, our kids aren't doing that out in the schools. They're not being the best version of themselves they can be. Mm -hmm. And I think that banning conversations of race and racism is problematic and we will never get to where we need to be as a country. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank you all for being joining us in the audience. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take a, a five minute break to move into our breakout sessions where we get to actually unpack what we've learned today and you'll hear from the perspectives of different, um, different faculty members and different uh, government officials, et cetera, on what, uh, their, through their lens of critical race theory. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone.